Um, hello, everybody. Um, happy Thursday. Um, I'm going to go ahead, ahead and get started. Sorry for the couple minute delay. I was having some technical difficulties. Um, so my name is Paula Schutt. I am the program manager of alumni relations here at Ave. Um, so welcome to this fabulous evening of learning and discussion with Ave Maria University's beloved politics professor, Dr. Sugru. Um, this evening we'll begin with remarks from Dr. Sugru on what next, a discussion about America's transition of power in DC. Then after Dr. Sugru's remarks, we will open the floor to questions and comments from all of you wonderful alumni. Um, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question during the discussion portion, please submit a C for comment in the chat box or a Q for question in there, and I will call on you during that discussion portion. Um, we ask also that you limit comments to about one to two minutes, and in order to allow uh, many people to enter the discussion, please only submit one question or comment. I know most of us are Aves and love a good debate slash discussion, but we also wanna make sure that everyone who would like to speak has a chance to do so. So our evening program this evening will go from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Just a reminder that Dr. Sugru's remarks will be recorded, but the discussion portion will not be recorded. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Ave Maria University's Chair of the Politics Department and beloved politics professor, um, ooh, lost my place, showcased by the attendees from going all the way back to 2005 today. So I would like to introduce you to the ever-inspiring and poised and intelligent Dr. Shauna Sugru. Well, hello. I am so happy to see all of you. My goodness, this is an incredible reunion for me. I mean, right now I can see Stephen and Brian and Gracian. I had seen Shannon just a while ago and I'm gonna scroll through it so that I get to see all of your faces. This is really exciting. Well. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. And before we begin, I want to extend a special thanks to Paula Shoot, class of 2016, for putting this together. And I want to thank Shannon Hale because she had approached me in the first instance. This was her idea. She wanted to see if this would be feasible. So it's really because of these two amazing women that we're all here today. So, boy, we have a lot to talk about because we are living at a point in our history that is unlike anything that we have seen before. And we've been through a lot as Americans. So that really is saying something. So in terms of the discussion for today, I'm structuring it in this way. First of all, I'm going to talk about some of the systemic factors that have brought about the moment that we're at in which we've been seeing this uprising of populism and that is underlying its expression both on the right and the left of the political spectrum. Then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Joe Biden and uh, what it is that we can probably expect over the course of his time in office. Most of this is not a surprise for those of you who are observers of politics, but I will uh, go through that briefly. And then I think we'll enter into the most interesting part of this discussion as we talk about the kinds of transformations that are happening today in the Republican Party on the one hand, as well as the Democratic Party on the other, because we're seeing a very dramatic reconfiguration of alliances that are happening. They're both unstable. Right now, it looks like the Republican Party is unstable. It is. I think we're soon going to see cracks, the cracks being exposed in the Democratic Party going forward. And then we'll open it for discussion because there's a number of things I'm really interested in your perspective about. And this is something I am looking forward to is the discussion back and forth. And as always, as it was the case in my class, remember that we are not our ideas. 
we are testing ideas and we can play devil's advocate with one another. Uh, and it is something which is, is very respectful. I, that's always been so with my students so and, and my beautiful alums, so I'm not too concerned about that. Okay, so let's begin and let's talk about those systemic factors that have brought us to this moment. And they're pretty large factors. It really goes back to the 1980s into the 1990s with the push from a industrial economy to a post-industrial economy. And this has come about as a result of the digital age. That we're now at a point where unless you have advanced skills in the manipulation of symbols like math or language or code or music or something of that nature, you're going to find that you're falling behind because the manufacturing portion of our economy has shrunk. Post-industrial economies are primarily service-based. And those services tend to be of two kinds, really great paying jobs in things like the uh, financial industry or marketing or uh, software development or poor paying service industry jobs, like one would find being a barista at Starbucks. So those kinds of jobs that had sustained middle-class Americans um, throughout the uh, heydays after World War II, those have largely disappeared. And that has profound implications for our economy, because those who have been the big losers from this transformation are middle class Americans who find that they have fallen behind economically. And they are competing with those who are immigrants to the country for these jobs, oftentimes, which are at the lower end of the spectrum being supply and demand that's going to push down wages. And this is much of the reason why throughout mature democracies, we've been seeing this anti-immigrant sentiment, which has become so prevalent because they're seen as a kind of economic threat to the middle class, which has been losing ground. Now, of course, add to this, that the digital revolution has brought new modes of communication. With these new modes of communication, we have increasingly been getting our information through social media. And as you well know, once you start to get your information in social media, you start to enter certain information silos in which the algorithms continue to give information to you based upon your interests. And that has had one of the effects of ceasing to um, challenge our worldviews and to associate us increasingly with people who just think like us, increasing the possibility that we'll have um, different realities or different ways in which we see things. Now, if this wasn't enough, um, we've also become in many ways a more militarized society in a couple of ways. One of these is one of the side effects of 9-11 that Congress had given substantial grants to provide um, weapons to police forces throughout the country. So we've seen this burgeoning of SWAT teams, which was something that weren't as prevalent within uh, the 1990s and the like. So even small little police forces are going to have incredible weapons that they can bring to bear and are interested in the training and using of that at the same time that the Supreme Court 2008, uh, 2010 had doubled down on the Second Amendment. So you've got a people who have some pretty serious weapons throughout the country, both the police who are more inclined to use them because they have them, as well as citizens 
who have become more vocal about their Second Amendment rights. Now, add to all of this the black swan event of the pandemic that we have been experiencing, which has isolated people in many ways have led to desperation, uh, both emotionally as well as economically, which has also put them further in their own personal silos. And you have kind of a perfect mix of how things could go very wrong. Recall that when we go through periods of great economic destabilization, that's when nations are oftentimes most vulnerable. Recall the Great Depression was a time which had given rise to different kinds of political movements as a way of responding to that kind of hardship. So first of all, I want us to see that these are issues that go beyond just blaming a specific person or candidate. Not that individuals don't matter, but I think we don't do ourselves a service if we say, oh, if only we got rid of so-and-so, or if only you know this person would get with the program, everything would be okay. We're dealing with um, something that is a, a really serious systemic set of changes that have happened, which have unleashed this. Okay, so what I want to talk about next is these, of course, are the forces that had brought on the right Donald Trump into the office of the president in 2016. But of course, populism isn't something which is simply a right wing phenomenon. We had seen it on the left of the political spectrum, too. However, after the Great Recession of 2008, it did start on the right. The first of these was the Tea Party movement, which started to evolve about 2010. Um, as we had more encounters with the police, uh, with primarily uh, Black communities, we got the rise of Black Lives Matter in 2013. Also on the left of the spectrum, we've had another form of a populism, our fourth wave of feminism that's been going on with the Me Too movement, uh, which put um, Justice Kavanaugh in uh, a, through just awful, awful confirmation proceeding, but that started to get going 2017. We're seeing a number of these populist movements that have been fomenting in America, but of course it's those on the right that oftentimes are actually um, have more legs politically and had brought Donald Trump into power in 2016. Now, to his credit, there's, he did achieve some um, notable things, some wonderful improvements in office. And amongst the things that Donald Trump definitely deserves credit for is that uh, with a Republican Congress, he was able to uh, restructure our tax code to make our businesses more competitive, reducing our corporate tax rate from 30 5% to 21%, which is really important if you're going to be competitive. Uh, so too, he had three very solid appointments to the Supreme Court. Um, those who um, tend to be originalists in their approach to the interpretation of the Constitution and textualists as they're interpreting statutory law. Now, um, the pandemic, if there's any one thing that really did in his presidency, uh, it is the pandemic. Um, generally, the two biggest predictors of who's going to uh, become the next president are number one, how's the economy going? In February of 2020, we had a 3.5% unemployment rate. Uh, everything was looking pretty darn nice with the American economy. And whatever divisions we had, if the economy continued on that kind of trajectory, it would have been very hard, hard for um, to have uprooted him. But um, the pandemic, which ended up sinking our economy in many ways, that was something which was um, lethal for his, his presidency. 
Add to that, that another strong predictor of who's going to win an election, according to the median voter th theorem, is who is perceived by the American people as more of a centrist. And he was appealing increasingly more to his base as opposed to the center. And we started to see a little bit of shifting of ground there that probably had hurt him too. But really, I think it was the economy as a result of the pandemic, which was what really hurt him the most in his prospects of winning. Now, um, the election of uh, 2020 uh, actually showed the remarkable and I think unexpected degree of support that Trump has amongst the American people because most commentators were thinking that it was gonna be a total blowout, a total win for Biden. And we're actually surprised by the extent of the support that he had from many Americans. And at this moment, after we have had a year of horrible protests that have emerged in violence, some over the summer, um, as we've had different kinds of riots that have been uh, associated with um, the, the search for uh, police reform on the one hand, and those who have a, a sense that the election was stolen from them, which led to the storming of the Capitol on June 6 on the other, you know, they, we've just had this explosion of sentiment within the American public uh, throughout this year, which is showing the deep fragility of are the moment in time that we're at. So not surprisingly, Joe Biden is doing the right thing in trying to unite the country as best he can. He's talking about unity. That was the theme in his inaugural address. And if you, in case we missed it, when he talked about unity, he repeated the word unity in quick succession to ensure that we're understanding that this is going to be one of the things he's going to be seeking while he is in office. In a moment, we're gonna talk about how difficult that's going to be for him because of what's going on in the larger culture and amongst the American people. In terms of, concrete programs, we know that the first of the programs that he's interested in is uh, more aggressively dealing with the coronavirus. Many Americans are hoping for another $1,400 check from the federal government, and we can debate whether that's going to be a good idea or not. But certainly that's one of the few things that both Republicans and Democrats in terms of the base can agree on in terms of something that they would like. In addition to um, more um, forceful measures, uh, forcing people to wear masks uh, through transport when they're traveling and things like that, uh, we're going to see that climate change is going to be one of his top priorities. This is not a strong priority for Republicans, but for Democrats, it is seen as an existential threat. And being an existential threat to this component of the population, they are determined to ensure that America is going to do everything possible to get away from um, oil towards new forms of renewable energy. And of course, for Shannon Hale, who hails from Canada, um, that means that the, um, the pipeline that uh, he vetoed yesterday is, is gonna hurt Canada very much. In addition to that immigration reform, but immigration reform that's moving in a completely different direction from Donald Trump, which is going to be more welcoming of immigrants coming into the country. 
So two social issues which are going to appeal to his base. We certainly are going to expect to see more funding to Planned Parenthood. We're certainly going to see that there's going to be doubling down on LGBTQ uh, rights and the like. And certainly race relations will be one of his top priorities. And none of this is any surprise to any of you. But in terms of foreign policy, we're going to see a shift away from a nationalist foreign policy towards a uh, globalist perspective uh, once again, which is the more traditional role that America has played within the world since the end of World War II. So now I want to talk about a few reasons why this is going to be tough for Joe Biden to, um, to establish unity, to you know, um, convince the Congress to pass these things. And while it's true that insofar as we're dealing with spending, he can deal, he can pass it through reconciliation, unless he's somehow successful in getting the Senate to change its filibuster rules, we do have enough control um, within the Senate with Republicans to slow him down there. So uh, what are going to be his major challenges? Well, first of all, the fissures or within his own party are soon going to become quite apparent that he has positioned himself as a centrist. I think that's a smart thing to do. But um, there are many in the very vocal progressive wing of the party who are not going to be satisfied with that and who are going to be increasingly demanding the kinds of change that those who are more centrist would regard as unacceptable and oftentimes rather radical. So two, within the Republican party, he's currently trying to um, court those who were in the never Trump component who had kind of shifted more towards the center and were leaning more towards the Democratic Party because of some concerns that they had in terms of Trump and his character and the like. But the Republican Party is going to need to reinvent itself. It's terribly fractured right now. Those fractures are on full display. If you're um, somebody who's a bit of a political junkie and you like to read the more popular pieces that are out there, uh, Michael Anton had published a piece in 2016 in which he was comparing that election to Flight 93, which is you absolutely have to vote for Trump because um, if you don't, it's an existential threat that the, the other side is going to tank this country like terrorists. And um, so Trump is the only alternative that we have. And then Rich Lowry, who would be in the never Trumper component of um, the more conservative end of the spectrum, uh, who was saying that's an awful reason to vote for Donald Trump and uh, he didn't regard him as, as competent and then the storming of the Capitol on the 6 has just reinforced that. So conservatives are trying to reinvent themselves. Is it possible to form a coalition amongst the different groups of conservatives uh, who ended up feeling quite um, on different ends of the spectrum in terms of Trump and his presidency. I don't know. So as Shannon had suggested, I want this to be a discussion. And so I'm going to put forth a few questions. And if you have questions or comments, or you want to take the discussion in a different direction, you're welcome to do so. And we're going to have Paula moderate it. But some of the questions that I might have for you, and I don't expect that you would have the perfect answer to it, because if you did, we already would fix it as a society. And these are huge issues. The first is social media. 
and the role of social media within our culture. We know that it has been deeply fragmenting. We also know that the control of it belongs in the hands of a, a few um, Silicon Valley techies. Uh, we're, uh, what do we do with control which of this platform in so few hands with a form of communication which has been so divisive but that um, cutting us off from a, it or regulating it has real serious First Amendment implications for people. So this is a huge issue. Another question I might ask you, underlying what we're going through is that we do have a sense of middle America losing ground. And we don't seem to have great economic programs for dealing with this. Can we just cut checks for these people indefinitely? Probably not. If not, how is it that we create an economy in which there's going to be meaningful work because many Americans, many people get meaning from their work uh, for the segment of the population where they feel like they have the dignity where they're able to support their families. Third question that I might have for you, and um, if you're on, um, you happen to be a Democrat, you can take it from the perspective of the Democratic Party if you tend to be more conservative, as many, I know many at Abe are quite conservative. Um, what should be done with this deep fracture that has emerged within the Republican Party and that I think we're soon going to see within the uh, Democratic Party as well. I mean, certainly we're going through party realignments, but what do you think in terms of the kinds of priorities that as Catholics we share? What's the best that can be done uh, in, um, with, with those who, who favor uh, respect for life, respect for religious liberty and the like. And so with that, I'm handing it over to Paula and I invite questions and comments. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Sugru. I'm gonna go ahead and 